Well, the summer of 2023 was the hottest on record. And scientists warn it could get even hotter if more action isn't taken. Take a look at how global surface temperatures have risen. This timeline starts in 1880, where you'll see more blue or cooler tones. But as the years go by, the planet heats up with deep orange hues or hotter temperatures filling that map. Carbon dioxide emissions, which contribute to heating up the planet, have also increased. On this timeline, tracing the past two decades, the CO2 looks at first like a haze, a light haze. But by the end of 2022, the map is deeply saturated with the greenhouse gases. Well, stopping these trends before they bring catastrophic consequences is the role of these regular gatherings. COP28 kicked off earlier today here in Dubai, and we already have some news to report. A long-awaited deal on a loss and damage fund was provided a short time ago. The idea is to provide finance for poorer countries hit hard by climate change. Another key focus issue will be how to bring down the use of coal, oil and gas, the fossil fuels, which are the primary drivers of the climate crisis. And we will be watching closely how those conversations develop. Well, many experts have suggested different solutions to mitigating the climate crisis. My next guest thinks that AI could be a powerful tool. Paragana has developed the first AI-powered platform that provides location-based analytics to capitalise on climate risk and opportunity. His main view on climate change is one of those alternate viewpoints that while we must continue trying to mitigate global warming, adapting to a changed climate should get more attention than it is getting. Well, this is the first year there will be a global stock take which tracks how how much progress we are making towards the goals of Paris. By such timelines, effectively, you know, we're not making any progress. In fact, we're going Correct. backwards at this point. So let's just start there. I know you hate mm. the word global stock take, and so do I, quite frankly. I mean, it kills any conversation dead. It does, <laughs> you know? it does. And it's, and it's crucially <laughs> important, of course. Let's start there, and then let's talk about what your sort of, the conceit right. of what your arguments are. Well, global stock take was clearly not designed by an ad or branding agency. <laughs> After all, the acronym is GST, which all of us think of as goods and services tax, <laughs> and stock take is one word rather than two and all mm. that. But I think the deeper point you and I would agree is that we need to stop just taking stock and instead start acting mm. and I think that there are many reasons for that first of all the maps that you just showed mm. how tragically behind the curve we are on reducing the total volume of greenhouse gas emissions 58 gigatons per year the map heating up the global average temperature did cross two degrees Celsius by the way from the pre-industrial baseline in November of this year decades ahead of schedule so there's mm. when it comes to taking stock I think we know that it's time mm. for much more action and that calls for radical solutions not only on the mitigation side which is to say more decarbonization a lot more technology but then adaptation because you cannot pretend that we can wait till 2040 when we mm. may or may not achieve certain goals of decarbonization and ignore along the way all of the human suffering and tragedy that is unfolding as a result of climate volatility so let's talk about adaptation then yeah. Well, adaptation means many things. For one thing, it's the infrastructure investments that we make to retrofit our built environment. What are we doing around food, water, and energy systems? What are we doing to cool certain areas? What are we doing to uh, build seawalls and, uh, mm. and deal with floods and hurricanes and coastal sea level rise and these kinds of things? So physical adaptation to accept if we have to, but of course cope with the inevitable realities. Some of that also involves population relocation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take that those maps that you showed mm -hmm. and you put in the population density of the world, let's bear in mind that some of the reddest, hottest <laughs> regions are the most densely populated. Just look at South Asia, for example. You advocate for young, skilled people to be mobile, migrate, and take advantage of nomad visa programs. Uh, many will say that will just benefit the richer or becoming richer countries. Well, there's a bigger question around the future of human geography, mm. right, as, as we adapt to climate change. And that involves individual people, yes, moving. And of course, they always have been. Even if climate change were not to take place or have occurred, 
India and Pakistan are among the largest countries of global emigration in the world in terms of people leaving every single year. That will accelerate due to climate change again. The fact is that if you care about adaptation for people, individual people, mm. not just millions but billions, you have to accept that migration is something that is happening already. Mm. According to the International Organization of Migration and other agencies, one third of the total number of displaced people in the world today are displaced because of climate change. Would you rather, I ask rhetorically obviously, mm. prefer that they simply stay put and wait for solutions to come mm. their way? So the the world is not prepared for a lot of the things that involve that adaptation requires, and one of them is accepting a great deal more climate migrants. You say that we've gone too far, that our complex environment has been bent too much, and we won't be able to snap it back into place. So, how do we adapt to support vulnerable nations? That's right. Now? And, you know, you look at things like the loss and damage fund, where, of course, it's been an argument about reparations mm. and, and this kind of thing. And it, and it pinpoints countries by the number of countries. It doesn't really think, as we were saying earlier, about the geography of those countries, how they're affected, the populations of those, and prioritize accordingly. It is so inherently political, mm. right? And, of course, the amount of capital committed is so paltry, one wonders why all that time was spent in that discussion, mm. right? As you know from today's discussion, yes, there was some agreement about a loss and damage fund, but voluntary commitments, right, and over what time frame and this kind of thing. Mm. So we really have to focus on the technologies. My view is that if you want to do good for the world, you can just boil it down to two very simple layman's kinds of uh, things that I advocate for. One is you either move people to the geographies of resources where they can live a better life and mm. contribute to global society, or you move technologies to people where they're needed if they are not mobile. Two things, move people to resources or technologies to people. That's what adaptation looks like in the real world. And we don't even need to be here, Becky, to mm. know what those things are, whether it's water desalination or drought resistant seeds, or again, flood controls and better irrigation, all of those things, we know exactly what to do, how much it costs, and the cost is getting cheaper. So let's just go out and do it. Are we being irresponsible or even reckless in not trying to mitigate the effects of climate change and, and focus our efforts on that? Can much worse lie for us over the horizon? Mm -hmm. To the contrary, at least 90% of total expenditure related to combating climate change already goes into mitigation and decarbonization. Mm. We're not going to stop doing that quite simply if for no other reason than that even if we were to never have COP28, COP29, mm. COP30, that to call the technological cost has come way down. So, so we're going to do it. So if we were to change our sort of mindset and, and, and the ratio of funding from mitigation, which you're right to point out is where the focus is at right. present. I'm going to change that from mitigation to adaption and I, uh, adaptation. And I hope our viewers now get a sort of sense of you know what, right. what, what the differences are. What would that look like? What would that, what would that flipping ratio mm -hmm. look like? Well, if it's 95% mitigation now and 5% adaptation, I would not reduce the mitigation. Mm -hmm. All the money in the world is available and should be deployed to confront climate change, this great existential civilizational challenge, no doubt about it. It's simply a lot more on the adaptation side. It is pressing, it is as existential, it is right now, it is necessary. It is the human lives that are being lost because we're not investing sufficiently in adaptation. What will success or failure look like here in Dubai? That's a great question. Well, we already know because so much of the conclusions are baked into the early preliminary deliberation process. So it's not likely that the 11th hour, and it is always the 11th hour, you'll be here at four in the morning having to come, well, hopefully not. But, uh, you know, it's always left to the last minute, and it's not going to be a strong, powerful statement. And even if it was, we don't know exactly what that's going to be followed up by. So to me, success is not about the words, right? It's about the deeds, the diplomacy of the deed. I think that's an important message for us to be sending right now to everyone who's here and everyone who's watching is that they can take real actions, both in mitigation and adaptation, to be clear, not just one or the other. And, uh, and so I want success to look like a really bold commitment of resources mm -hmm. towards more adaptation in addition to mitigation. Which means cash and lots of it. And technology. Please, mm -hmm. let's remember that the cost of that technology is much less. Right. Yeah. But, you know, in order to 
you know, invest in that technology. We're talking about cash. Yeah. I mean, and it doesn't have to come just from the governments. Let's be mm. clear. What I think the mobilization, and you've seen this in successive mm. years, the huge presence of the private sector, the global corporate mm. community. In the past, we could say, sure, that was virtue signaling. Sure, that mm. was greenwashing. Now we know that they do view it yeah. as a significant investment opportunity. So there is all of that money available. Yeah. No, no, no. And, and if you can de-risk it to the extent that yes. more, more will. Uh, We'll, we'll come in, Absolutely. it will be good news. And I know that's a big focus of the meeting here. Thank you very much indeed. It's always you, a pleasure.